Still have to name them. You want to name all of them right now? All right. We'll name uh, this half Marlon Jr. and then this half Coral Jr. Okay, we're done. I like Nemo. Nemo? Well, we'll name one Nemo, but I'd like most of them to be Marlon Jr. Just think in a couple of days, we're going to be parents. Yeah. What if they don't like me? Marlon. Oh, really? There's over 400 eggs. Odds are one of them is bound to like you. In the movie, there's a scene where Marlon and his wife look at the eggs and they say that there are around four, more than 400 to name. What is the typical clutch size for clownfish? And is it accurate to the movie? Uh, so, yeah, clownfish can actually have anywhere from 100 to 1,000 eggs in a single clutch. They're actually very interesting and have an unusual life history, as all clownfish are prodandrous hermaphrodites, meaning they're born with dominant male reproductive organs and inactive or recessive female reproductive organs as well. And within a single anemone, there is a one monogamous mating pair consisting of the only female in the group and the largest male, and the rest of the clownfish are developmentally uh, sexual juveniles. Um, the eggs are first released by the female into the nesting site and then fertilized by the male and attached to a substrate surface, normally rock or coral nearby, and the male is in charge of caring for the eggs, um, fanning them to regulate oxygen levels in the water nearby and temperature. In addition, they eat any damaged or unfertilized eggs to clear out the nest. Which is kind of weird, Marlin. <laughs> In that heartbreaking opening scene, the Barracuda comes and eats both Marlin's wife and most of the eggs, except for Nemo. Do Barracudas actually eat clownfish eggs? No, that's not really likely. The typical diet of a barracuda is smaller fishes such as jacks, grunts, groupers, snappers, small tunas, mullets, killifish, herrings, and anchovies. But they aren't n known to eat fish eggs. Marlin's got that covered. <laughs> Do you want this anemone to sting you? Yes. Brush. <sighs> okay, I'm done. Up, oh, you missed a spot. Where? There. <laughs> In the scene where Marlin and Nemo are getting ready for school, Nemo tends to brush his teeth up against the anemone. What is the relationship between clownfish and sea anemone? Do they actually have to brush themselves to avoid getting shocked? So, not exactly. Sea anemones and clownfish have one of the most well-known symbiotic relationships, and it's a bit more complex than one might expect. Sea anemones have nemocytes, which are stinging cells um, along their tentacles that they use for protection. Clownfish, however, have a unique mucus coating that prevents them from being affected by it, and they can therefore live in relative safety in and amongst the anemone. Um, the sea anemone isn't just protecting the fish for free, though. The clownfish also provides protection by chasing off potential predators, and it can provide nutrients in its waste products, such as ammonia, sulfur, and phosphorus. Some recent research has also found evidence that the relationship between these organisms is even more intimate with evidence for the microbiome of the partners changing with their interactions over time, and possibly cycling carbon between them. However the physical touch modifies them though, the depiction of brushing to achieve rec recognition seems to be a bit of an exaggeration on the film's part. Oh well, creative liberties. Hey Plankton from next door, he said that sea turtles said th th they live to be about a hundred years old. Well you know what, if I ever meet a sea turtle, I'll ask him. So Mr. Tur- Crush! Crush, I forgot! How old are you? 150, dude! And still young! Rock on! 150! 150! I gotta remember that! Marlin and Nemo talk a decent bit about how long sea turtles live. What's the average lifespan, really? Assuming the turtles shown are representation of green sea turtles, Chelonia Midas, there is not an exact answer. Their estimated lifespan is around 60 to 70 years, though which is though which is pretty darn long. Hmm, I wonder where we're supposed to go. Bye. Bye. I'll pick you up after school. What's up with that weird fish that carried its kids to school in its mouth? Is that real? 
Yes siree! There are actually types of fish called mouth brooders that use their mouth to shelter their eggs and or off young offspring. There are many different types including chicklids, sea catfish, cardinal fish, bagrid catfish, pikeheads, jawfish, goramis, and aruanas, and either the male or female may keep the offspring in their mouths. The most famous example is probably the female African kitchelids, which carry their eggs for between 21 and 36 days. That's a long time. From fertilization to hatching without eating, they also carry the juveniles in times of perceived danger, using specialized behavior signals to call her young back into her mouth. Mmm, yummy. Look on three. Three? Three, three. three sharks? There's gonna be 4,800 teeth! You see, kid? Marlin claims that there are 4,800 teeth between three sharks. Is that accurate? Well, okay. So based on their animated appearances, it looks like they're a great white, a mako, and a, and a great hammerhead. Assuming that's the case, and that they're all fully developed adults, we can make the following estimate calculations. For a great white, the average number of teeth is about 300 total in up to seven different rows, but only 50 of them are working at any given time. Hammerheads have 24 to 37 per row, and several rows per jaw, so let's give that another 300. The Mako was harder to find information on, but I think it's really unlikely that it's going to make up the 4,000 tooth difference between what Marlin has said and what the numbers actually are. Okay, to the East Australian Current, EAC. Oh, dude. You're riding it, dude! Check it out! Is the East Australian Current real? Yes, the East Australian Current actually is a real thing. Even if it isn't used for thrill-seeking by surfer adventure turtles, surfer see fuck it takes two <laughs> is the east australian current real yes it is actually real even if it isn't used for thrill seeking by surfer sea turtles it's actually a really influential current moving warm water down the eastern coastline of australia it is the largest ocean current near australia and according to the data from nasa and csiro marine research moves as much as 30 mil Ooh. 30 million cubic meters of water per second in a pan that is as large as 100 kilometers in width and 50, 500 meters deep. Kid, if there's anything you need, just ask your Auntie Deb. Oh, that's me. <laughs> or if I'm not around, you can always talk to my sister, Flo. <laughs> Hi, how are you? <laughs> Don't listen to anything my sister says. She's nuts. <laughs> oh, I can't see Flo. Flo? Has anybody seen Flo? Flo? There's a scene where Flo speaks to her mirror self and calls it Deb. What do you think about this in the mirror test? So yeah, if you're not familiar with the mirror test, it's um, a test for the ability of self-recognition, where an organism is um, able or not able to recognize itself in a mirror. It's a way to get um, a measure of their self-awareness and consciousness. In Finding Nemo, the character Deb acknowledges her reflection as a separate being, her sister, Flo. This raises the question, are fish able to pass the mirror test? While there's no sources I could find on the specific type of fish that Deb is, there is a new report that records that three-fourths of fish tested on were able to pass the mirror test after being accustomed to it. So no, she probably wouldn't have thought that the mirror was her crazy sister. Just like in rehearsals, gentlemen. So what are we? Take a guess. Oh, oh, I've seen one of those. I'm a fish with a nose like a sword. Wait, wait. Um... It's a swordfish. Oh, hey, clown boy. Let the lady guess. There are those tuna fish that make formations and caricatures. How do fish really coordinate flocking movement? Fish coordination is actually a super fascinating area of research, and while they may not be making improv impressions underwater, they can make some aggressively complex movements. There are two distinct types of movements, shoaling and schooling. Shoaling is less structured, more temporary, and can be loose, a loose aggression of fish of differing species, while schooling is highly structured, 
with common directionality and coordinated movements. While we don't understand the exact me mechanisms of how some of the really complicated m movements work, we do know that fish have a unique sensory system to allow for this behavior. In addition to using their vision, they have a lateral line, an extremely sensitive mechanosensory organ along the sides of their body that helps detect any changes in water pressure around them, helping them keep track of their movements of their neighbors precisely.